On the AP Biology exam, you're often asked to create graphs from tables and interpret their meanings. So naturally, this video is all about data. Let's go. Hey guys, this is Mikey from Avo Prep Academy, and on this channel, we cover AP Biology content. In today's video, we're going to dive into the exam, particularly focusing on questions that pertain to creating graphs from data. Typically, graphing questions come up in the FRQ section, specifically question number two. This has been pretty consistent over the past few years, so I have a fairly strong feeling that the same thing would apply in the coming exam. First, let me begin by saying that in 99% of the scenarios, you'll either be creating a bar graph or a scatter plot, with the bar graph being a little bit more common. But before we get to discussing when to use which graph, let's have a quick overview of elements that apply to all graphs. First, whether you're creating a bar graph or a scatter plot, you'll be working with the XY coordinate system. In all circumstances, you'll be labeling the X axis with your independent variable, while the Y axis would contain your dependent variable. Second, graders of the exams are specifically asked to check for certain features present in all the graphs that students create. Here, we have to make sure that we're putting in both the axis labels as well as the units if applicable. Missing one or the other will cost you some points. Now, note that you don't actually need to title your graphs, though writing a simple description at the top wouldn't really cost you too much time. Third, for all graphs, be sure to use as much space as possible without going over the lines. Don't take up like 10% of the space given. Okay, now that the basics are out of the way, let's talk about when to use which graph. The major difference between scatter plots and bar graphs comes down to whether the x-axis is a continuous variable or a discrete or categorical variable. Long story short, for continuous variables, we use a scatter plot, while for categorical variables, we would use a bar graph. Let's take a look at some examples. As we have just mentioned, the x-axis is our independent variable. So for instance, if a given experiment is testing the amount of enzymatic activity as a function of substrate concentration that increases in increments like shown here, then our independent variable is that substrate concentration, and is of course numerical and continuous. This means that we can make a claim about how enzymatic activity changes as we slide back and forth along the x-axis, even extrapolating or interpolating between the data points on hand. This is a case in which a scatter plot will be appropriate. Not that you would actually have to do this, but the creation of a regression line could even give you a linear function that could be used to estimate whatever our dependent variable would be given the input of some value in our independent variable. Next, let's take a look at an example of when a bar graph will be appropriate. In this example, we see that we're looking at four strains of bacteria and their response to a particular antibiotic. Because the four strains of bacteria are not continuous, but rather a discrete or a categorical piece of information, we would use a bar graph. Notice how the values between the bars have no meaning whatsoever because strains A, B, C, and D are not numerically relevant to one another. Now that being said, there are some tricky situations where a seemingly continuous variable such as time or temperature still would call for a bar graph. Now, in certain ambiguous circumstances like these, the AP exam will explicitly ask you to draw either a bar graph or a scatter plot. However, in cases where that's not given, we still need to make the ultimate decision. So in this example, example, we see that we have a table that contains two factors that could act as independent variables. One is time, with time zero and time four hours as a factor, and the other is bacterial strains A and B. Our dependent variable, of course, is the number of colonies observed on a growth plate. Now, in this scenario, it actually makes sense to use a bar graph. Firstly, it isn't the case that we're trying to relate how the number of colonies change as a function of time, but rather time was used to indicate the before and after condition of the bacteria with respect to the antibiotic application. As a result, we're not so interested in what's actually happening between times one and two. Secondly, we see that we have two columns of data to plot. In these cases, it's easy to simply draw two bars per x-axis category, placing both factors into a single graph. But this can create multiple possibilities. Here, you could use time as the major category along the x-axis, while using two bars to each indicate bacterial strains A and 
and B. Now, alternatively, you could use the bacterial strains A and B as your major axis labels while using the two bars to indicate time zero and time four. Regardless of which direction you go, be sure to include a legend that discerns the two bars and what they represent somewhere in your graph. Now, let's actually take a look at some real world examples from previous year's exams. In 2024, the exam asked you to construct a bar graph specifically for the data being presented. In this table, it's clear that we would have to choose whether we would use the temperature or the metabolic markers as the major X axis categories. And choosing temperature, we would have oxygen consumption and ATP synthesis as our two bars within each temperature category. Notice how we're using the exact same units for both bars, which is nice as even the values we're given to plot all fall within relatively similar values. In 2023, we were not given instructions on which graph to use, but because our independent variable is species or normal versus elevated CO2, it goes without saying that we would be using a bar graph here. Here, I would advise using the species as our independent variable as we'd be able to make good comparisons of what would happen to mitochondria within species and between CO2 levels in an instant. In both of these graphs, please make sure that you're doing a pretty good job with drawing error bars as accurately as possible as those plus and minus indicators require you to draw the error bars into your graphs. Moving back another year to 2022 FRQ, we're given a slightly different assignment. Notice how here we're given both the strains of corn, which is a categorical variable, but also the number of double-stranded breaks, which is potentially a numerical and continuous variable. But wait, the instruction says something interesting. It says construct a graph that allows the examination of a possible core correlation between double strand breaks and crossovers. The word correlation means everything here because correlation is about how a change in one variable affects a change in another. Therefore, we're given the very important clue that this should be a scatter plot that relate to continuous correlative variables. Looking at the sample answer, it's clear to see that we could imagine a regression line and that we will be able to infer that there is a direct relationship between the number of double strand breaks and the number of crossovers, as well as knowing which strains of corn represents which plot. Hopefully, these examples clarify which types of graph to use in each case scenario, paying a close attention to information provided in the questions themselves. Another major idea that I wanted to explore in this video is the meaning of error bars in AP Biology. Whether whether we're working with graphs or tables provided to us, or further describing the data that we've just graphed, we need to understand that error bars can tell us whether the data points are actually different in a technical way. Most, if not all, of the data points that we see presented in graphs are means or averages. These means would have originally included numerous individual datum that could either have a big range or a small range. This variance is what is represented by the error bars. If the variance is rather large, that means that there are some data points within a mean that could be very big or very small. But without going into the technical details, when these error bars overlap between two means, it indicates that some of the values from one mean could easily be larger or smaller than the values from another mean. This overlapping indicates that there is no significant difference between these two points. Here, we can't even say that one mean is larger than the other because any term that indicates a different cannot be justified in a statistical way. As such, whenever the exam asks you to identify which value was different from another, we're always looking for means that have error bars which are clearly not overlapping. These questions can come up in both MCQ and FRQ, so it's always good to keep this on the back of your mind. I hope this video has clarified much of what you are curious about in data and graphing. If you have any specific examples or questions that you'd like to ask, leave a comment below. And as always, if you found this video helpful, be sure to click that like button and subscribe to the channel. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next video.